Okay. <clears throat> okay, good morning class. Today we have jury charge. And so let me give you some words that come out. You have your honor for the record, uh, court caput, when you can replace judge, petitioner, Devin Michaels, Karen May Michaels, uh, Colorado Law, Judgment Declaration, Devin Michaels, Brian, Karen May Michaels, State of Colorado, Dr. Mason, you have Uh, Marcy, Brian, Mr. Lopez, New Mexico, Manuel Ortega, Officer Ortega, Harry Robbins, Residence, George. Okay, and um, Respondent is written SPONT, S-P-O-N-T for Respondent. You have... Um, Um, requirements, declaration, child support is short, K-H-O-R-T, okay? And um, just a minute. Let me Oh, you already gave words? Yes. Okay. Okay, this will be at 160. Your Honor, for the record, I would like to advise the court of certain facts in this case. The petitioner, Karen May Michaels, obtained a divorce from her former husband, Devon Michaels, which became effective according to Colorado law on March 1st of this year. Among the many items in the judgment declaration, one of the requirements was that Devon Michaels was to provide hospital and dental insurance for the three minor children of this marriage. By way of refreshing everyone's memory, the names and ages of the minor children are Kay, 10 years of age, Brian, 6 years of age, and Marcy, 4 years of age. Your Honor, I'm reading directly from the judgment. Please refer to page 10, line 22. This section reads as follows. As part of the child support obligation of the respondent, Devon Michaels will continue to furnish medical, dental, and hospitalization for the minor children of this marriage through employee employer deductions. This provision will be continued until each child has reached the age of 18 or marries, which ever occurs sooner. Mr. Michaels is a resident of the state of Colorado. He works for the Sutton Industries in their Denver branch. As part of the group employment benefits of Sutton Industries, Michaels and his dependents were eligible to receive dental insurance coverage under a prepaid package, which is jointly paid by the employer employee. Sutton Industries is located and headquartered in Denver, Colorado, which several subsidiary offices throughout the state. According to the contract between Sutton Industries and the Allied Insurance Group, Coverage for dental care does not extend to out-of-state residents. Since the divorce, Karen May Michaels has relocated to Dallas, Texas, where she now resides with the couple's three minor children. Since March of last year, Ms. Mrs. Michaels has been taking her children to Dr. Mason in Dallas for dental care. She has taken Kay to the dentist on two occasions and Brian and Marcy on one occasion. Three months ago, a claim for dental services reimbursement was filed by Dr. Mason with the Allied Insurance Group. Allied took the position that they were not responsible for out-of-state dental care. 
So far, Dr. Mason has not been paid for services rendered to the three minor children. The total amount in question here is $250. The dental package states only that the primary insured, which in this case is Devon Michaels, must reside within the state of Colorado. No specific language is used to refer to the residence requirements or dependents under the Allied Insurance Group's policy coverage stipulation. Your Honor, it is our contention that Devon Michaels is liable for payment of dental services rendered to his three minor children. If in fact coverage is not provided through the Allied Insurance Group, then Mr. Michaels should furnish this dental coverage on his own. We ask the court to order the respondent, Devon Michaels, to pay all dental bills incurred as of this date and in the future. We ask the court to protect the rights of these three minor children. Your Honor, I will make my statement regarding the defendant, Harry Robbins, very brief. He has become a victim of circumstances and should not be tried as a co-party defendant in this case. On August 31 of last year, Hector Lopez discovered a late model Cadillac Eldorado parked on an outlying pasture in his dairy farm in Prado, New Mexico. Mr. Lopez questioned several of his farm workers and found that they knew nothing about the car, nor did they know who the car belonged to. Mr. Lopez contacted the local sheriff's department that day. In the evening, Officer Manuel Ortega responded to the scene where the car was parked and spoke to Mr. Lopez. Ortega ran a registration vehicle check on the vehicle determined ownership. The car was registered in the name of the defendant, Harry Robbins, who lives 150 miles from Mr. Lopez's farm. Officer Ortega searched the car. In the back seat, he found a vehicle registration card and a driver's license belonging to Harry Robbins. In the trunk of the car, Officer Ortega found seven cellophane baggies containing a white powdery substance, later determined to be cocaine. The cellophane baggies were inside of a brown paper shopping bag. Ortega thoroughly searched the rest of the car and did not find any other illegal substances. The following day, Officer Ortega contacted the Sheriff's Office in Las Cruces, New Mexico, where Harry Robbins resided at the time. Two officers went to Harry Robbins' residence and asked him about his automobile. He said it had disappeared two days prior, but he had not reported it to the police as stolen because he thought maybe his brother George had taken it and he didn't want him arrested if he in fact had taken the vehicle. The police detained Harry Robbins for an hour and then decided to arrest him. Upon arresting him, they found in his possession one half ounce of cocaine. During the questioning of Mr. Robbins, he told the police that he did not. Okay, so it starts with a petitioner's claims and then it goes into a different speed building. Just so you know, it changes names different. <clears throat> so this will be at 170. Ready? Your Honor, for the record, I would like to advise the court of certain facts in this case. The petitioner, Karen May Michaels, obtained a divorce from her former husband, Devon Michaels, which became effective according to Colorado law on March 1st of this past year. Among the many items in the judgment declaration, one of the requirements was that Devon Michaels was to provide hospital and dental insurance for the three minor children of his marriage. By way of refreshing everyone's memory, the names and ages of the minor children are Kay, 10 years of age, Brian, six years of age, and Marcy, four years of age. Your Honor, I am reading directly from the judgment. Please refer to page 10, line 22. This section reads as follows. As part of the child support obligation of the respondent, Devon Michaels will continue to furnish medical, dental, and hospitalization for the minor children of this marriage through employee employer deductions. This provision will be continued until each child has reached the age of 18 or marries, whichever occurs sooner. Mr. Michaels is a resident of the state of Colorado. He works for the Sutton Industries in their Denver branch. As part of the group employment benefits of Sutton Industries, Michaels and his dependents were eligible to receive dental insurance coverage under a prepaid package, which is jointly paid by the employer employee. Sutton Industries is located and headquartered in Denver, Colorado, with several subsidiary offices throughout the state. According to the contract between Sutton Industries and the Allied Insurance Group, coverage for dental care does not extend to out-of-state residents. Since a divorce, Karen May Michaels has relocated to Dallas, Texas, where she now resides with a couple's three minor children. Since March of 1 of last year, 
Mrs. Michaels has been taking her children to Dr. Mason in Dallas for dental care. She has taken Kay to the dentist on two occasions and Brian and Marcy on one occasion. Three months ago, a claim for dental services reimbursement was filed by Dr. Mason with the Allied Insurance Group. Allied took the position that they were not responsible for out-of-state dental care. So far, Dr. Mason has not been paid for services rendered to the three minor children. The total amount in question here is $250. The dental package only states that the primary insured, which in this case is Devon Michaels, must reside within the state of Colorado. No specific language is used to refer to the residence requirements for dependents under the Allied Insurance Group's policy coverage stipulations. Your Honor, it is our contention that Devon Michaels is liable for payment of dental services rendered to his three minor children. If in fact, coverage is not provided through the Allied Insurance Group, then Mr. Michaels should furnish this dental coverage on his own. We ask the court to order the respondent, Devon Michaels, to pay all dental bills incurred as of this date and in the future. We ask the court to protect the rights of these three minor children. Your Honor, I will make my statement regarding the defendant, Harry Robbins, very brief. He has become a victim of circumstances and should not be tried as a co-party defendant in this case. On August 31 of last year, Hector Lopez discovered a late model Cadillac Eldorado parked on an outlying pasture on his dairy farm in Prado, New Mexico. Mr. Lopez questioned several of his farm workers and found that they knew nothing about the car, nor did they know who the car belonged to. Mr. Lopez contacted the local sheriff's department that day. In the evening, Officer Manuel Ortega responded to the scene where the car was parked and spoke with Mr. Lopez. Ortega ran a registration check on the vehicle to determine ownership. The car was registered in the name of the defendant, Harry Robbins, who lives 150 miles from Mr. Lopez's farm. Officer Ortega searched the car. In the back seat, he found a vehicle registration card and a driver's license belonging to Harry Robbins. In the trunk of the car, Officer Ortega found seven cellophane baggies containing a white powdery substance later determined to be cocaine. The cellophane baggies were inside of a brown paper shopping bag. Ortega thoroughly searched the rest of the car and did not find any other illegal substances. The following day, or Officer Ortega contacted the Sheriff's Office in Las Cruces, New Mexico, where Harry Robbins resided at the time. Two officers went to Harry Robbins' residence and asked him about his automobile. He said it had disappeared two days prior, but he had not reported it to the police as stolen because he thought maybe his brother George had taken it, and he didn't want him arrested and he, if he, in fact, had taken the vehicle. The police detained Harry Robbins for an hour and then decided to arrest him. Upon arresting him, they found in his possession one half ounce of cocaine. During the questioning of Mr. Robbins, he told the police that he did not know the whereabouts of his vehicle for two days and that he did not know how the cellophane baggies of cocaine appeared in his trunk. He admitted that he used cocaine, but that he was not a dealer. The police Are there any questions on anything? Hi, Joanna. Hello. Oh, I don't, you're on mute. So I'm just going to keep reading because, yeah. let's see. Any questions? Shake your head. Yes, no? Okay, thank you. Okay, this will be at 180. Ready? Your Honor, for the record, I would like to advise the court of certain facts in this case. The petitioner, Karen May Michaels, obtained a divorce from her former husband, Devon Michaels, which became effective according to Colorado law on March 1st of this past year. Among the many items in the judgment declaration, one of the requirements was that Devon Michaels was to provide hospital and dental insurance for the three minor children of his marriage. By way of refreshing everyone's memory, the names and ages of the minor children are Kay, 10 years of age, Brian, 6 years of age, and Marcy, 4 years of age. Your Honor, I am reading directly from the judgment. Please refer to page 10, line 22. This section reads as follows. As part of the child support obligation of the respondent, Devon Michaels will continue to furnish medical, dental, and hospitalization for the minor children of his marriage through employee-employer deductions. 
This provision will be continued until each child has reached the age of 18 or marries, whichever occurs sooner. Mr. Michaels is a resident of the state of Colorado. He works for the Sutton Industries in their Denver branch. As part of the group employment benefits of Sutton Industries, Michaels and his dependents were eligible to receive dental insurance coverage under a prepaid package, which is jointly paid by the employer employee. Sutton Industries is located and headquartered in Denver, Colorado, with several subsidiary offices throughout the state. According to the contract between Sutton Industries and the Allied Insurance Group, coverage for dental care does not extend to out-of-state residents. Since the divorce, Karen Mae Michaels has relocated to Dallas, Texas, where she now resides with the couple's three minor children. Since March 1 of last year, Mrs. Michaels has been taking her children to Dr. Mason in Dallas for dental care. She has taken Kay to the dentist on two occasions and Brian and Marcy on one occasion. Three months ago, a claim for dental services reimbursement was filed by Dr. Mason with the Allied Insurance Group. Allied took the position that they were not responsible for out-of-state dental care. So far, Dr. Mason has not been paid for services rendered to the three minor children. The total amount in question is $250. The dental package states only that the primary insured, which in this case is Devon Michaels, must reside within the state of Colorado. No specific language is used to refer to the residence requirements for dependents under the Allied Insurance Group's policy coverage stipulations. Your Honor, it is our contention that Devon Michaels is liable for payment of dental services rendered to his three minor children. If in fact coverage is not provided through the Allied Insurance Group, then Mr. Michaels should furnish this dental coverage on his own. We ask the court to order the respondent Devon Michaels to pay all dental bills incurred as of this date and in the future. We ask the court to protect the rights of these three minor children. Your Honor, I will make my statement regarding the defendant Harry Robbins very brief. He has become a victim of circumstances and should not be tried as a co-party defendant in this case. On August of last year, Hector Lopez discovered a late model Cadillac Eldorado parked on an outlying pasture on his dairy farm in Prado, New Mexico. Mr. Lopez questioned several of his farm workers and found that they knew nothing about the car, nor did they know who the car belonged to. Mr. Lopez contacted the local sheriff's department that day. In the evening, Officer Manuel Ortega responded to the scene where the car was parked and spoke with Mr. Lopez. Ortega ran a registration check on the vehicle to determine ownership. The car was registered in the name of the defendant, Harry Robbins, who lives 150 miles from Mr. Lopez's farm. Officer Ortega searched the car. In the back seat, he found a vehicle registration card and a driver's license belonging to Harry Robbins. In the trunk of the car, Officer Ortega found seven cellophane baggies containing a white powdery substance later determined to be cocaine. The cellophane baggies were inside of a brown paper shopping bag. Ortega thoroughly searched the rest of the car and did not find any other illegal substances. The following day, Officer Ortega contacted the Sheriff's Office in Las Cruces, New Mexico, where Harry Robbins resided at the time. Two officers went to Harry Robbins' residence and asked him about his automobile. He said it had disappeared two days prior, but he had not reported it to the police as stolen because he thought maybe his brother George had taken it and he didn't want him arrested if he, in fact, had taken the vehicle. The police detained Harry Robbins for an hour and then decided to arrest him. Upon arresting him, they found in his possession one half ounce of cocaine. During the questioning of Mr. Robbins, he told the police that he did not know the whereabouts of his vehicle for two days and that he did not know how the cellophane baggies of cocaine appeared in his trunk. He admitted that he used cocaine, but that he was not a dealer. The police refused to believe his story and he has been in jail since September 2 of last year, awaiting this hearing. Your Honor, Harry Robbins is not a dealer and he should not be tried as a co-party defendant. He had no knowledge of their criminal activity. Okay, and then this will be at 190. Ready? Your Honor, for the record, I would like to advise the court of certain facts in this case. The petitioner, Karen May Michaels, obtained a divorce from her former husband, Devon Michaels, which became effective according to Colorado law on March 1st of this past year. 
Among the many items in the judgment declaration, one of the requirements was that Devon Michaels was to provide hospital and dental insurance for the three minor children of his marriage. By way of refreshing everyone's memory, the names and ages of the minor children are Kay, 10 years of age, Brian, 6 years of age, and Marcy, 4 years of age. Your Honor, I am reading directly from the judgment. Please refer to page 10, line 22. This section reads as follows. As part of the child support obligation of the respondent, Devon Michaels, will continue to furnish medical, dental, and hospitalization for the minor children of this marriage through employee-employer deductions. This provision will be continued until each child has reached the age of 18 or marries, whichever occurs sooner. Mr. Michaels is a resident of the state of Colorado. He works for the Sutton Industries in their Denver branch. As part of the group employment benefits of Sutton Industries, Michaels and his dependents were eligible to receive dental insurance coverage under a prepaid package, which is jointly paid by the employer employee. Sutton Industries is located and headquartered in Denver, Colorado, with several subsidiary offices throughout the state. According to the contract between Sutton Industries and the Allied Insurance Group, coverage for dental care does not extend to out-of-state residents. Since the divorce, Karen Mae Michaels has relocated to Dallas, Texas, where she now resides with the couple's three minor children. Since March 1 of last year, Mrs. Michaels has been taking her children to Dr. Mason in Dallas for dental care. She has taken Kay to the dentist on two occasions and Brian and Marcy on one occasion. Three months ago, a claim for dental services reimbursement was filed by Dr. Mason with the Allied Insurance Group. Allied took the position that they were not responsible for out-of-state dental care. So far, Dr. Mason has not been paid for services rendered to the three minor children. The total amount in question here is $250. The dental package states only that the primary insured, which in this case is Devon Michaels, must reside within the state of Colorado. No specific language is used to refer to the resident's requirements for dependents under the Allied Insurance Group's policy coverage stipulations. Your Honor, it is our contention that Devon Michaels is liable for payment of dental services rendered to his three minor children. If, in fact, coverage is not provided through the Allied Insurance Group, then Mr. Michaels should furnish this dental coverage on his own. We ask the court to order the respondent, Devon Michaels, to pay all dental bills incurred as of this date and in the future. We ask the court to protect the rights of these three minor children. Your Honor, I will make my statement regarding the defendant, Harry Robbins, very brief. He has become a victim of circumstances and should not be tried as a co-party defendant in this case. On August 31 of last year, Hector Lopez discovered a late model Cadillac Eldorado parked in an outlying pasture on his dairy farm in Prado, New Mexico. Mr. Lopez questioned several of his farm workers and found that they knew nothing about the car, nor did they know who the car belonged to. Mr. Lopez contacted the local sheriff's department that day. In the evening, Officer Manuel Ortega responded to the scene where the car was parked and spoke with Mr. Lopez. Ortega ran a registration check on the vehicle to, de to determine ownership. The car was registered in the name of the defendant, Harry Robbins, who lives 150 miles from Mr. Lopez's farm. Officer Ortega searched the car. In the back seat, he found a vehicle registration card and a driver's license belonging to Harry Robbins. In the trunk of the car, Officer Ortega found seven cellophane baggies containing a white powdery substance, later determined to be cocaine. The cellophane baggies were inside of the brown paper shopping bag. Ortega thoroughly searched the rest of the car and did not find any other Ill illegal substances. The following day, Officer Ortega contacted the Sheriff's Office in Las Cruces, New Mexico, where Harry Robbins resided at the time. Two officers went to Harry Robbins' residence and asked him about his automobile. He said it had disappeared two days prior, but he had not reported it to the police as stolen because he thought maybe his brother George had taken it, and he didn't want him arrested if he, in fact, had taken the vehicle. The police detained Harry Robbins for an hour and then decided to arrest him. Upon arresting him, they found in his possession one half ounce of cocaine. During the questioning of Mr. Robbins, he told the police that he did not know the whereabouts of his vehicle for two days and that he did not know how the cellophane baggies of cocaine appeared in his trunk. He admitted that he used cocaine, but that he was not a dealer. The police refused to believe his story, and he has been in jail since September 2 of last year awaiting this hearing. Your Honor, Harry Robbins is not a dealer, and he should not be tried as a co-party defendant. He had no knowledge of their criminal activity, nor even who they were until 60 days ago. We ask the mercy of the court to allow Harry Robbins to be tried separately on one charge, possession of cocaine. Thank you for your attention at this time.
the one you unmute. Um, which one? Oh, okay. Okay. I'll ask her. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. <clears throat> and what's where are you? I did one right. Oh, you got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, Joanna, do you have any, thank you so much, Michelle, any questions? Uh, no, ma'am. Or Diana, any questions, ladies? No. On the words? No? No. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Any questions on the words? No? No. No. Okay, this... Diana, can you can you hear me? I can hear you. Hmm. Let me see. She said she uh, Joanna, can you hear me? Because I can't hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Hmm. So what I'll do is I'm going to do um, the test then, since I can't hear you all, to read back. Right, you all? I can. So this is going to be your test. I don't know if you want to stay on. Um, these will be your tests. So you've got on your test 180 jury charge number one, you have James Pardo, Jake Randall, Douglas Schaefer, Marla Pardo, Defendant Schaefer, Tampa, Florida, Marla's Mary, John, Tampa Bay, Clearwater, Fred White, and Largo. Okay? And this is going to be 180 jury charge test number one for five minutes, and it's called appellate review. <coughs> for five minutes, you all. Your Honor. We affirm the judgment in this case as to guilt. We also affirm the judgment in this case as to one of the two special circumstances findings. But we ask for reversal of the judgment as to penalty. The facts of this case are that the defendant has been charged with the murder of James Pardo and Jake Randall. The special circumstance of multiple murder was alleged to each count of murder. The defendant, Douglas Schaefer, was also charged with assault with intent to rape and kidnap a minor Marla Pardo. Defendant Schaefer was convicted on all counts. The two special circumstance allegations were found to be true, and the defendant Schaefer was sentenced to death by lethal injection to take place within 120 days of the final pronouncement of penalty. I would like to go over some of the facts of this case. Marla Pardo testified at the trial. She said that on January 15, two years ago, she was 14 years old and lived in a two bedroom apartment in Tampa, Florida with her father, James Pardo. Also living in the apartment was Marla's 13 year old sister, Mary, her six year old brother, John, and the defendant, Schaefer. Marla had known the defendant as a family friend all of her life. One year prior to the murders, defendant Schaefer had begun living with the family because he was unable to find a place to live. The defendant then had a job working in a gas station as an attendant. James Pardo had helped him secure this job because the station owner was an old school friend of Pardo's. During the evening hours of January 15, Marla and her sister Mary went to a friend's house to listen to tapes. They returned home at 9.30 p.m. James Pardo and the defendant, Douglas Schaefer, had been drinking. When the girls returned, the two men were engaged in a heated argument. James Pardo accused the defendant of stealing money from the gas station. The defendant denied the charges in front of the girls. James Pardo then instructed his daughters to go to bed. Marla and Mary went into the bedroom, which they shared with their younger brother, John. John asked them to be quiet so he could fall asleep. Apparently, the arguing had kept him awake. About 10.30, the girls and John fell asleep. The next morning, Marla awoke and got ready for school. She woke up her sister and little brother and told them to get ready for school. She then went to the kitchen to make coffee. As she walked down the hall toward the kitchen, she saw her father lying face down in the hallway that separates the kitchen from the living room. 
In the kitchen, she saw their neighbor, Jake Randall, lying on the floor covered with blood. Then Marla saw the defendant seated on the couch in the living room as if in a daze. She screamed at him, what happened? He said, they're both dead, I shot them. Marla ran to the phone to call 911, but the defendant darted from the couch and grabbed her. He laughed and said, don't bother, it's too late. At that time, Mary and John came out of the bedroom. The defendant instructed them to return to the bedroom and close the door. He said, don't come out until I call you. Defendant Schaefer then ordered Marla to remove her clothing. When she refused, he held the gun to her head and threatened to shoot her if she did not comply. Marla removed her clothing and then the defendant attempted to rape her. While he was unable to do so, he told her to get up and get dressed. A few minutes later, the defendant again threatened Marla. This time he told her, don't turn me in or I'll kill your brother and sister. Defendant Schaefer then told Marla to help him drag the bodies to the trunk of her father's car. He said he planned to dump the bodies in Tampa Bay. He then ordered Marla to get a pail of water and some soap so that he could scrub up the blood on the tile floor. As he was down on his hands and knees scrubbing, Marla struck the defendant full force on the back of the head with a flower vase. The defendant was stunned only for a second. He jumped to his feet and slapped Marla and said, don't try that again. He then ordered Marla to tell her brother and sister to leave for school, which she did, hurrying them out the front door and avoiding the kitchen. The defendant then ordered Marla to go with him in her father's car over to a friend's house in Clearwater to borrow some money. The defendant had Marla put the murder weapon in her purse. The defendant then drove to Clearwater to the beach area. He stopped at an apartment one block from the beach and told Marla to wait in the car or he would kill her brother and sister. Marla waited while she saw the defendant knock on a door and talk to Fred White. She saw Fred White hand some money to defendant Schaefer. The defendant then returned to the car and they started driving towards Largo. By this time, two hours, And then you have your 180 number two and proper names that come out. You have Judy and Ken Maxwell, Child Custody Agreement, County Children's Services Division, Patricia, Children's Services Division. And um, jury charge number two for five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we are here to discuss the custody of three minor children, the products of the marriage of Judy and Ken Maxwell. This case is an issue because both of the parties would like to have custody of the three children and neither parent can agree on who should get custody. First, let me give you an overview on my experience with child custody situations, and then the attorneys for both parties and myself will consider the facts presented by both sides to determine which party should have custody, if custody should be shared jointly or the most extreme decision, that the custody of the minor children should be awarded to a third party. Any understanding that we arrive at will be written into the child custody agreement and filed with the County Children's Services Division. All decisions made are subject to revision and review at stated intervals to be defined in the child custody agreement. Normally, custody of the minor children is routinely awarded to the mother. The law in prior years has always assumed that the mother was in a better position to see to the care and nurturing of minor children. For the father to be awarded custody, he had to prove that the mother had committed one of the following offenses, child abuse or neglect, immorality or abandonment. Times have changed since the court always gave the custody of the children to the mother. Today, most judges, including myself, try to focus on the welfare of the children involved. What is in the best interests of the children? I try to consider the children's opinions so that they do not become pawns in divorce wars, as I like to call them. 
at the top of my list in awarding custody to one party or to another is to look at the stability of the home environment. The divorce process disrupts the child's life. The court tries to minimize as much as possible this disruption. <clears throat> the court talks to each and every party interested in being a custodial parent to determine whether or not they can offer a stable home environment where that child will thrive and grow into responsible adults. Traditionally, it has been a fact that the parent who keeps the family home is the one who gets custody. Today, this is not always true. Parents who can provide adequate housing for children at another location where the atmosphere is similar in respects to the original family dwelling are not denied custody. All reasonable living conditions are considered, but they must attempt to duplicate the original home environment in order to provide stability and security for the minor child. In this case, we have three children involved. As a judge, I think it is very important to keep these children together. They have lost either a mother or a father as a party of their household. I believe it to be unfair to them to deprive them of each other's company. Fortunately, in this situation, all the parties desiring custody of these three children have agreed that they should be together. <clears throat> Their custody will be considered as a unit. As the children mature, this decision may be readdressed by all parties involved. My next area of consideration because of the ages of these children is the supervision consideration. Two of the children are not of school age and will require 24-hour supervision. I will be considering the working hours of both the parents who they will rely on for child care, who they will rely on for after school care, and who they will rely on for evening and weekend babysitting chores. These are important considerations in this case because these children are still in the formative years. I have decided to talk to your oldest child, Patricia, regarding her feelings as far as custody factors in this case. She is a very mature little girl and she is entitled to express her feelings regarding where she wants to be and with whom. Both of the parties seem to be fit parents who genuinely care for the children, but who cannot agree on provisions for custody because of the type of jobs that each of the parties have. They have agreed that the children should not leave this state and relocate. This is in the court's favor because it is helpful to me in making my decision. I have decided because of the unwillingness of the parties to consider a joint custody agreement that that will not even be considered by me in my decision. One party will have custody of these minor children and one party only. Now, suppose that your party is the losing party and does not get custody of the three children. You still have visitation rights, which will be worked out through the Children Services Division. These visitation rights give the non-custodial party the right to see the children on weekends and stated holidays. The details of the visitation agreement must be abided with by both parties. I would like to have the parties now prepare to present their arguments for custody. The court will adjourn for 15 minutes in order to allow counsel to prepare and review notes before I begin the questioning of all parties involved. Before this questioning process begins, I would like the three children involved in this. And we'll get ready for your 160s. Different book. 160, number one, proper names that come out. You have none. Let me make sure I don't see court. Court, I do see it. Anytime you can replace judge in the sentence, capitalize court. This is going to be 160, number one jury charge for five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, again, do not think that the attorney is trying to hide anything from you or doesn't want you to know all about it because he makes the objection. It is his duty to make that objection. If I sustain the objection, I am saying I think he is right under the law and the question cannot be answered or the evidence cannot be offered and received in evidence. Now, if the attorney has not gotten on his feet fast enough 
and the answer is blurted out and I sustain his objection, I'll tell you to disregard the answer. I may order it stricken from the record or I may ask you also to disregard the question. And if I do ask you to do that, you are to erase it from your mind just as if it had not happened. On the other hand, if I overrule the objection, I am saying that I feel that the attorney is not right in his objection under the law and the question can be asked and answered or the bit of evidence can be offered and admitted. Now, ordinarily I make these rulings and frequently I do that. On the other hand, the attorney may want to be heard on that. He wants to give me some argument to show why he is right why I should rule in his favor according to the law. In which case, two things may happen. He may ask to approach the bench. We had this happen several times during the questioning and they may make a little argument to settle out of the presence of the jury. Again, we are not trying to hide anything from you. We are trying to resolve an issue of law. If he wants to make a lengthy argument on it, he wants to be heard, we will ask you to go to the jury room and the same thing takes place, arguing issues of law. And we are not trying to hide anything from you. So you understand, I think that if I permitted you to hear the argument that they wanted to make on the law, depending upon how I ruled, it could be quite prejudicial to one side or the other. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I am now going to read to you the instructions on the law that you will apply to the fact situation that you have heard over the last several days. When I have finished doing that, counsel for the prosecution has a right to make what I call a closing argument. As the instructions tell you, the closing argument is not evidence. It is a summary of what the prosecution believes that he has proven in this case a summary of the testimony as he sees it. If you remember it differently from the way he sees it, you remember it the way you remember it. Counsel do not intentionally misstate what has been said. You remember it the way you remember it. After the prosecution finishes with the closing argument, defense counsel has a right to make a similar closing argument in which he makes a summary in the same fashion. The district attorney then has the right to make a final closing argument or rebuttal argument and they can divide their time any way that they want to in making their closing. When we finish their closing arguments, you will go to the jury room to deliberate and you will be able to take these instructions with you. If you miss some words, you will have them in the jury room and also you will have all of the exhibits which have been admitted into evidence. Before I read the final instruction and explain the verdict forms, I take it that the first 12 jurors that we have in the box are not ill and are able to deliberate. So that after I read this final instruction, the 12 jurors will go to the jury room. If the two alternates have anything in the jury room, you can go in and get it. But I don't want you to discuss anything with the other jurors. At this time, you're excused from the jury and you're discharged with our thanks. We will not need the two alternates. Ladies and gentlemen, the verdict must be representative of the considered judgment of each juror. Each juror must agree to the verdict. So your verdict must be unanimous. Everyone remains seated while the jury files out. Go to the jury room, please. You two alternates can go in and get their belongings and then leave. The bailiff will take you into the jury room and he will give you the exhibits which have been admitted into evidence and the court will be in recess pending the verdict. And so we have your 160 number two. You have instruction number one, instruction number three, complaint and information. Instruction number four, instruction number five, instruction number six, instruction number seven, instruction number nine. And remember, instruction is written S-T-R-U-X. Okay. 
This is going to be 160 number two jury charge for five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I want to extend my thanks for all of your attention in this case. Sometimes we have been boring, but you have been very attentive to all the evidence. And that's really critical so that all 12 of you, when you deliberate collectively, can recall the events and testimony from your own memories. The instructions I read to you yesterday are all important. They are the all-encompassing instructions in this case, and I would like to go through with you briefly and repeat a few things and point out a few things. Instruction number one is rather lengthy, and I think the very important thing for you to remember is on the second page of this instruction. It's the final sentence. It says, finally, you should consider all the evidence in the light of your observations and experiences in life. You see, we don't ask computers to decide this case. We ask rational, intelligent human beings to come together as a group and to look at the evidence and to decide this case. And you are entitled to consider your experiences and observations in life. In instruction number three, it says the information is a mere accusation. When you think of the normal definition of information, it's material that you obtain through whatever source that's called information. But there is a legal term for information, the actual piece of paper which charges the defendant with murder is called a complaint and information. And that's what I mean in instruction number three. In other words, the complaint or the information is a mere accusation against him until the prosecution meets its burden of proof. It is the term for the legal document which charges him with murder. Instruction number four deals with the various things that I read to you before we started the evidence in this case. That the defendant is presumed innocent until such time as you have heard the evidence and decide that the evidence is sufficient beyond a reasonable doubt to prove that he is guilty or not guilty. It defines reasonable doubt. And right in the definition of reasonable doubt are the words common sense. Because again, you use your common sense as human beings in assessing the evidence in this case, applying it to the law and reaching the conclusion that you should. Reasonable doubt means a doubt based on reason and common sense, which arises from a fair and rational consideration of the evidence in the case. It's not a vague doubt, not a speculative doubt, not an imaginative doubt. You can't look and say, well, I want to try to find a doubt because I want to find this person guilty. That's against the law. It's not a speculative doubt. You have to have a real doubt. Instruction number five talks about credibility. And I told you the things that you can look to in determining the credibility of the witnesses, their knowledge, their motive, their state of mind, their demeanor or manner on the witness stand their means of knowledge, their ability to observe, their strength of memory. Instruction number six talks about felony convictions. I asked you if a person came into court and testified and said they had a felony conviction, would you agree to be open-minded and to listen to what they said and to determine whether that made any sense to you or would you close your mind to what they said just because they had a felony conviction? We don't manufacture witnesses, ladies and gentlemen. We take the witnesses that are available to us, the people who know about the case. If that includes a minister or a governor, so be it. If it includes someone with a felony record, that's the way it is. And we present them to you as fairly as we can. Two of the witnesses both have felony convictions. You have to decide whether that's important to you or not. So instruction number six says you can determine how much weight to give to the felony convictions of those two witnesses. Think over the various things that apply in that particular respect. Instruction number seven talks about experts. Instruction number eight says the mere number of witnesses is not important. If we had 20 witnesses or two witnesses, it's what all the evidence adds up to that's important. Instruction number nine tells you that under the law in this state, 
there are two types of evidence that are equally considered. One is direct evidence. The second is circumstantial evidence. The law makes no distinction between direct and circumstantial evidence. Perhaps you have seen a murder or you have read of it where you receive all the clues and you decide based on all the, those were very, very good. Um, so that concludes our class for today. Hopefully you all type one up. Have a great day, you all.